Hi, this is Nicole Lovett um, from the Social Science Research Council. I'd like to welcome everybody here today on behalf of the SSRC, the East West Center in Washington, DC, and the Japan Foundation in New York. Um, you're joining us for the Abe Fellows Global Forum for 2024 uh, called Beyond Resilience, What Japan Can Teach the World About Disaster. And we're looking forward to a great program today. I'm gonna turn it over to Masaya Shimoyama from the Japan Foundation New York office. Thank you, Nicole. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Masaya Shimoyama, Director General of the Japan Foundation New York office. Uh, today, I'm very pleased to be here with um, my friends um, in, at the uh, SSRC, Nicole and Linda, to welcome all of you to the uh, eighth annual Abe Global Forum. Please also let me thank the uh, East West Center, Washington, D.C., for their collaboration once again this year to bring this event to fruition. The Abe Global Forum was started in 2017 with the intent to share the vast knowledge of the Abe Fellows and the Abe Fellows for Journalism, who conducted research on United States, Japan, contemporary and global issues with a broader audience. There are almost 450 Abe Fellows and that is a quite a bit of knowledge to share. The theme of today's forum is Beyond Resilience, what Japan can teach the world about disaster. Unfortunately, Japan has a lot of extensive experience in dealing with various types of disaster. As you are aware, in Japan, the new, new year began with the great disaster of the Noto earthquake Hundreds of people lost their lives, and many individuals in that area are still suffering. In response to this tragic situation, people in the United States, including the government, have expressed sympathies for the victims and indicated, uh, initiated various activities to aid those in need. We, the Japan, Japanese people, sincerely appreciate it. Thank you very much. As you know, Tragic events like the Noto earthquake are not uncommon in Japan's history. The Great East Japan earthquake occurred in 2011, just 13 years ago, and caused tremendous disaster. And only 15, 16 years prior, in 1995, the Great Hanshin earthquake struck the Sunsai area. People in Japan confront major earthquakes almost every decade. Yet, the earthquakes are not the only cause of natural disaster in Japan. For example, large big typhoon cause suffering in various regions almost every year. In this context, yes, Japan has variable experience to share, to teach, which might be helpful to other countries. Simultaneously, Japan has also learned from the world and will continue to learn a lot from the world in many ways. Therefore, I'm confident that today's discussion will offer valuable insights and meaning to the people of both countries and beyond. Now, I would like to briefly touch on the new, our new and exciting program that we are conducting which is called the Japan Foundation Indo-Pacific Partnership Research Fellowship. That is de de designed to promote international research and collaborative activities on common policy issues with the intention of bringing about peace and prosperity to this region and beyond. We have only just announced the uh, 16 inaugural participants recently. We an anticipate opening the call for the next round in March this year. We hope some of you find this of interest and apply. Please keep an eye out on the, uh, our website or sign up or, or for our newsletter. So thank you very much for tuning in. And now without further ado, let me turn the program over to Dr. Mary Alice Haddad. Mary Sensei, the chair of the forum, please go ahead. Thank you, 
uh, Shuoyama-san uh, for that lovely welcome to everyone. And I would like to extend my welcome also. I think we have people in almost every time zone around the world. So thank you for joining us. Uh, we have a terrific set of four speakers today to spur our discussion on what we can learn from Japan's experience with disasters and resilience. Just to let you know what to expect, I will do a very brief introduction of all of our speakers. Each one will take eight or nine minutes to speak. That will be followed by a panel discussion facilitated by me, um, and then we'll shift over to Q&A from the audience. Feel free to submit your questions uh, to the Q&A function on the webinar at any time uh, during the discussion or the talk, and we'll get to as many of them as we can. So without further ado, our first speaker will be Professor Jordan Sand, who is a professor of Japanese history at Georgetown University. His research and writing have focused on architecture, urbanism, material culture, and the history of everyday life. He's won numerous fellowships and awards, including a Fulbright Fellowship, Abe Fellowship, Research Fellowship for the National Endowment for Humanities. His books have won awards such as the John King Fairbank Prize from the American Historical Association and the John Whitney Hall Prize from the Association of Asian Studies. His current work explores what Tokyo's historical management of urban risks can teach us about how to manage and prepare for disasters with a focus on Asia's growing megacities. Anuradha Mukherjee is an associate professor of community and regional planning at East Carolina University. Her research is located at the intersection of disaster planning, climate change adaptation, and community resilience. She uses the Japanese experience to help uncover and explain how municipal land use strategies during large scale land use reorganization after catastrophic, catastrophic events. She has also been an Abe Fellowship and her research has been supported by the National, National Science Foundation, Asia Pacific Network, and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration to name a few of her funding sources. Her publications have appeared in many diverse journals, such as the Journal of Environmental Planning and Management, International Journal of Disaster Risk Reduction, and the International Journal of Housing Policy. Her current research focuses on community-based land use adaptations developed during disaster recovery to strengthen overall community resilience. He Jung Chang is a professor of geography and associate dean of research and graduate programs at Portland State University. His research examines the complex interactions among climate change, land use change, and water management. He's been an Abe and an AAG fellow and has won grants from the US National Science Foundation, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Korea Ministry of Science and Education, and the City of Portland, to name a few. His research has earned him many prizes, including an AAG E. Willard and Ruby S. Miller Award from the Association of American Geographers, the Best Paper Award in the Journal of Environmental Policy, and a Choice Award from the Association of College and Research Libraries. His current research looks at the use of data mining and computational intelligence for improving water, improving urban water management. And last but not least, Daniel Aldrich is Professor of Political Science and Director of the Security and Resilience Studies Program at Northeastern University. His scholarship explores the interaction between social networks, public policy, and the environment. He's been an Abe Fellow, a Fulbright Scholar, and his research has been supported by numerous grants and fellowships, including the National Science Foundation, Japan Foundation, the V. Khan Rasmussen Foundation, the East-West Center, to name a few. His books have also won awards from the NPO Research Association, and his more than 70 peer-reviewed research articles have appeared in journals such as the Journal of Disaster Research, Journal of Japanese Studies, Journal of Environmental Management, and Journal of Public Health, to name a few. His current research looks at how social infrastructure helps communities survive disasters and become healthy and more vibrant in the years that follow. I will turn it over to Jordan Sand for his remarks. Thank you very much, Mary Alice. I hope everybody hears me all right. I'm going to go right ahead and share screen. There we go. I hope that you can see that. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with old friends. Uh, I was an Abe Fellow in 2016, 2017. Uh, it was an extraordinarily uh, 
valuable year for me. And uh, my thanks to the SSRC, Nicole, and everybody for that. Let me set my little timer. Um, I'm not going to be talking about uh, earthquake today, and I hope nobody thinks that uh, I, there's any intent to avoid the subject or make light of it. I'm going to focus on uh, other sorts of disaster uh, resilience uh, with uh, Tokyo as its center, but I'm going to take you beyond Tokyo as well. That's not. Um, we often talk about, uh, particularly in the architecture field, uh, resistance versus resilience. And uh, these images, I think, encapsulate the distinction and perhaps the most iconic example of a resilient architecture often cited in the Japanese case is uh, the use of a, a pendulum-like uh, core column in tall structures that uh, imitating uh, what's believed to be a strategy in uh, the long life of uh, uh, Japanese pagodas, a kind of a, a, a device to uh, allow a building to uh, sway and um, uh, persist through earthquake. But I think we can dig down a little deeper and think about resilience in different forms uh, and not only resilience in steel structures. And so I offer you two sorts of very different resilience, both from Tokyo. On the left, uh, you are looking at uh, a, a part of the uh, enormous uh, um, underground drain system under eastern Tokyo that uh, has made it possible for a city that used to flood with considerable regularity uh, now to have survived several decades without the kind of major floods that were uh, common early in the 20th century. And you can see this almost cathedral-like structure uh, hidden underneath uh, the city today that has uh, um, facilitated flood management in Tokyo. On the right, just about two centuries ago, this is a uh, close-up from a portion of a long screen painting. I'll show you more of in a moment. Uh, of firefighting in the city of Edo, former uh, the former name of Tokyo. Uh, and it may look like chaos, uh, uh, but what we're seeing is firefightings, firefighters boldly jumping roof to roof. Uh, the structures themselves are very uh, simple, lightweight wooden structures. And uh, as a consequence, I'm referring to this as light infrastructure resilience. The object here is uh, not to douse and extinguish the flames, which was impossible at the time in a city of wood, uh, but to strip the buildings or collapse them and allow the fire to burn itself out, uh, thereby diminishing damage to other parts of the city. Uh, and in fact, as a city of over a million people built entirely of wood, Edo burned with tremendous frequency as this uh, remarkable map uh, indicating the path of 200 fires through the city uh, from the 17th to the late 19th century uh, done by a Tokyo University physicist uh, suggests. And you can see these long lines are showing the point of ignition and the point of extinction of fires. They burned right across the city, but these firefighters managed to sort of choreograph them so that uh, they would uh, burn downwind until they extinguished themselves and the rest of the city would remain intact. <clears throat> this meant for residents uh, also these uh, dramatic conflagrations that visited not infrequently, uh, that people developed the uh, skill to flee quickly uh, in the path of a fire. And here we see one of the last great conflagrations of the 19th century, uh, depicted in a woodblock print. And when you close up on uh, the people alongside the banks of the Sumida River here, you can see that people have fled with their household belongings. They are preparing to take ref refuge on the far side of uh, the river. And they even have brought with them their tatami floor mats and the doors of their houses. So they have stripped their houses down to nothing and left uh, the simple frame to burn. And from the uh, painting scroll I showed you a minute ago, uh, another close-up 
of uh, here people having taken refuge with their household belongings, setting themselves up, little temporary shelter, even as the firefighting continues elsewhere in the city. These are the sorts of houses that these people lived in, low rise, very high density, built entirely of wood. And obviously these houses were matchboxes quite literally. Uh, and on the periphery of the city, construction like this actually continued uh, into the 20th century. These were called slums by the social bureaucrats of the time, uh, but you can see a certain order and, and rationality this, to this construction, however squalid. I, I want to put in a quick plug for two uh, special issue, journal special issues that were products of my uh, Abe research period. Um, and I, I put in this plug in particular because both of these uh, provided opportunities to uh, colleagues of mine here in Tokyo, where I am at present, uh, and elsewhere in Asia uh, to publish in English together with me, uh, scholars whose work has uh, otherwise not been uh, available in English. And we also produced a website still under construction uh, where we went and uh, talked to people in uh, communities uh, around uh, Asia and included their stories as long as along with them um, photographic documents. Uh, my own cont contribution uh, in part was a little micro history of the building of Tokyo in the late 19th and early 20th century through this now largely forgotten figure who was actually one of the uh, biggest developers in uh, 19th and 20 early 20th century Tokyo, a man named Osaki Tatsugoro. And uh, the only surviving photograph of his very simple structures, you can see they're very much like what I showed you a moment ago. One of the most interesting things about uh, his own account of his building career is that we learned that these buildings were portable. And there are several cases in which he would take apart uh, the buildings in an entire neighborhood and move the buildings together with the residents to other parts of town. And one of the things that made this possible was a highly uh, modular uh, standardized construction of uh, traditional Japanese wood architecture. I took students and we visited some of the neighborhoods where uh, he built, and of course, none of these uh, houses survive today, uh, but the alleys he laid out are still intact. People have rebuilt in sturdier uh, form in uh, two stories, and it's made for a rather pleasant uh, pedestrian neighborhood. Other members of our uh, collective interviewed people in uh, their own cities. Here, my colleague Uji uh, Nugroho, who worked with informal settlers in Yogyakarta. And everywhere we went, uh, people would have stories of community resilience, uh, have stories of mutual aid, um, community in <laughs> adverse circumstances can form quite quickly. It's not a matter of generations. And they build themselves quite elegant gates, even if the conditions in their community are rather squalid. Uh, similar stories <clears throat> on the margins of the city of Yangon in Myanmar. We visited in 2017. Here, people building a house. They said it would take us three days. This little woman is the house owner, she was going to spend 250 US dollars to build this house entirely of bamboo. A couple of miles down the road, a supplier of <clears throat> woven mats and bamboo poles for building these houses. These people live in very, very vulnerable circumstances and a cyclone could easily blow the entire neighborhood away. And it turned out they were vulnerable in another sense as well, because this was the site uh, two years ago of a horrific uh, massacre by the Myanmar military. But I heard from local community activists that 60% of the neighbor, neighborhood had subsequently moved back in again and rebuilt their lives. Similarly, in Bangkok, a city that floods regularly, people learn to accommodate and uh, live with uh, regular flooding. And finally, 
I, I use the word risk. I think we could talk much more about what it really means, but it's very common for politicians today speak of protecting people from risk to life and property. And one of the arguments I'd like to make here is that we should uh, be more careful in distinguishing these two. Here we have the irony of a case like Southern California, where people's mansions are protected by firefighters at tremendous risk to those firefighters' lives. Uh, at the bottom, we see another piece of the picture scroll of a fire in Edo. This, the municipal authorities did nothing to protect people's property, but people managed to protect their lives and start them all over again very quickly, even as the fire had barely been extinguished. That's all of my slides. Thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Jordan. Go ahead, <laughs> Anuradha. Sorry. I was just trying to, uh, given the limited time we have. Right. Um, can you see the slides? Okay. They look great. Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to Nicole and others, uh, SSRC East West Center and the Japan Foundation for putting together this uh, really wonderful panel. Um, today in this presentation, um, I hope to examine urban housing recovery in the city of Sendai. Uh, of course, after the Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami in 2001. Um, and my hope is to examine resilience through, uh, through this uh, case study. Um, this is part of the work that I did after, uh, as, um, during my uh, time as an Abe Fellow, uh, which was in, I believe, 2013, between 2013 to 2015. And I look at uh, resilience through um, the framing of um, Idebski and his colleagues and their colleagues, uh, who've talked about uh, how analysis of governmental interventions to mitigate um, and adapt to the consequences of catastrophic events uh, tend to isolate these measures from their larger social contexts, and as a result, overlook the uneven distribution of their benefits and burdens across different groups. And in Sendai, I propose that the adaptive processes that reinforced resilience at the city level, they in turn incur different burdens across socioeconomic groups within the city. Um, the, the housing recovery that happened in Sendai uh, happened within the context of certain policies. There are sort of these three legs uh, of three sort of three different policy sets. The first is housing policy. According to Hirayama, uh, housing policy in Japan is uh, has argued that um, th there's a, this is a two tiered system where um, number one, uh, Japan focuses on the expansion of owner-occupied housing and so concentrates resources on moderate to high income groups. So that's number one. The other part of this housing policy is that uh, public housing units predominantly owned by prefectural or local governments are then rented out to low-income households who are not able to purchase a home in the private housing market. So there is this two-tiered sort of ho housing policy framework that extends to post-disaster housing recovery as well. The other piece of the other policy leg that I want to uh, quickly touch on is the decentralization of planning. Japan has been taking steps um, while housing policy has remained unchanged ever since the Kobe uh, earthquake in 1999. Japan has enacted a series of decentralization reforms that has given greater powers to municipalities in specifically for this case over local land use and planning decision making. So in the, this is what is uh, important for um, the case study that I touch on. And the, the last policy leg that I want to touch on is land use planning in Sendai itself, a city that has been facing a demographic challenge, just like many cities across the Japan, uh, anxieties over aging and shrinking populations. And so their land use strategy has been to pursue what they call a compact city form, uh, which is link, linked to its demographic challenges, and that has two aspects to it. The first is to encourage urban growth close to the city center and discourage sprawl at um, the edges. 
Um, and so in Sendai, that means the city has been encouraging development at its um, at uh, at the center and discouraging and restricting development along its coastlines. And so that is one aspect. The second aspect of Sendai's land use planning for, um, sort of strategy has been to concentrate urban development along its transportation corridors. So Sendai, the city of Sendai has these two main subway lines, east, west, north, south. Uh, the, the north, south is the Namboku subway and the east, west is the Tozai subway line. And they have tried to densify urban development along those subway corridors, the transportation, main transportation corridors. So very quickly, this is where Sendai is located. For some of you who might not be familiar with uh, uh, Japan, this is the, uh, the northeast part of Japan, Tohoku region, where the, the earthquake and the tsunami hit. These are the three main prefectures, Fukushima, Miyagi, and Iwate. And as you can see, Sendai is right here in Miyagi prefecture. Sendai is a metropolitan of 1 million inhabitants. It's the largest city in the Tohoku region. Uh, the damage in Sendai was mainly at the coast, which was here, right here in Miyagi and Miyagino and um, Wakabayashi yards, uh, ward, sorry. Um, some 8,100 households were inundated. The central urban uh, district of Sendai is located in Aoba yard, right here in the middle, and that was largely undamaged. This is just quickly to show you the inundation along the coastline of the city of Sendai um, in uh, Bakabayashi Award, sorry. And this is to show you um, central urban uh, district of Sendai city, where as you can see, it, there, there, is, there is not much damage visible after 3-11. Um, and these were images taken by the US uh, Marine Corps. This one was by the US Marine Corps and the previous one was by the US Navy. Very quickly, the land use plan of Sendai, uh, the red solid line that you can see here, this is where the tsunami inund uh, inundation happened. Um, the red here, or all the red that you see in the center, these are all commercial retail areas. The blue that you see, this is all uh, industrial district. Um, yellows and the greens, these are all residential areas predominantly. And this line that you see, the black line, this is the east-west uh, subway. Uh, this was built after uh, the 311 disaster, actually, with funds from the national government. Very quickly, a schema of what was planned for um, um, after the disaster. Um, communities that were along the coastline, uh, the planning was to relocate them inland and close to or inside that urban, um, close to the urban fringe or inside the, uh, the urban district in order to densify the city in line with their compact city um, strategies. Two key uh, policies or programs rather were used. Uh, the national government had a whole array of programs as part of its uh, reconstruction recovery uh, package. Uh, the two programs that were predominantly used for housing recovery in Sendai, number one was the collective relocation sites through which, which was funded by the national government's collective um, housing relocation project. And it was used to relocate some 1,500 households out of the coastal area to relocation sites on the fringes of Sendai. The other uh, uh, aspect was the public housing, which was using another program, which was funded through the national government's disaster public housing development project. And here, it was this this part of the program was predominantly uh, private uh, developer driven. So the government just gave uh, basically invited uh, bids from private developers who then went out acquired land, uh, build the housing developments, uh, design the units, build the housing developments, sold it back to the Sendai city government, and then the Sendai city allocated those to eligible households through a lottery system. Um, I would just very quickly say that, so the housing uh, projects that were put into place, the housing recovery program that was put into place in Sendai, um, there are definitely positive lessons to learn here from Japan on creating affordable housing, uh, especially housing stock for uh, low-income populations after a disaster, which is a key aspect of resilient communities. At the same time, I would uh, say that there are a few points uh, of concern that we can note, or rather points of caution that we can note here. 
So num uh, the first is that the new public housing units that were built after 311 are concentrated along the subway corridors. Again, this was to densify um, in line with the compact city forms to densify and create uh, more urban density along the transportation corridors. Um, those uh, apartments, those public housing units are close to uh, public amenities such as transportation, shopping, and medical services. So that's uh, where the, and I'll show you in a slide very quickly where they're located. The post-disaster relocation sites, which is where mainly individual houses came in, they either leased a land piece of plot from the uh, Sendai city government or they bought a piece of land there and built their own housing. Those are located mainly at the urban fringe. And so in here, what you can see is these boxes where you can see the blue uh, marked areas. This is the community. These are the communities which were emptied out after the 311 disaster. And the, the boxes, the areas that are marked in solid red or the dotted red, these are the collective uh, relocation sites where people either leased or bought a piece of plot from the Sendai city government and build their own housing. So you can see they are all at the urban fringe. This is the urban fringe of the city of Sendai. This is the coastline of the city. The public housing units, uh, in contrast, uh, this is uh, the transportation uh, corridors. This is the northwest and this is the uh, east-west subway lines. The red squares that you see, these are all located along these um, subway corridors. And so what's happened is that you have the public housing units along the subway corridors, whereas the relocation sites along these this urban fringe right here, and that has created what is what has become like this partial segregation. So the younger households with financial resources to rebuild are the dominant group that have gone into those relocation sites at the urban uh, fringe of Sendai, whereas the dominant group in those public housing units are mainly low-income elderly households. And so what we see as a result today in Sendai uh, is post-disaster housing that is marked by a spatial segregation of elderly population. The other uh, point to quickly note is that uh, most of these, this is all, these circles that you see are all public housing units. Again, they are along the transportation corridor, but if we overlay with the land use plan of Senda, you will see that they are predominantly in these red areas. And so what that means is that the public housing units are not really integrated into the residential neighborhoods in those green and yellow areas, but located along the commercial areas, um, along those transportation corridors. And as a result, it's not just a past partial segregation, but also there's a social isolation of elderly population that have been impacted by the disaster. Uh, just uh, uh, a few images of the public housing. This is housing number four, housing number five, and public housing number 12, there were like some 32 public housing sites. And so very quickly concluding points. Uh, so decentralization of planning in Japan has transferred decision-making power to local governments, and that has meant more decision-making power over land use and planning for long-term resilience. So it has reinforced resilience at the city level in Sendai, but it has also led to uneven distribution of its burdens across the different socioeconomic groups. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Mukherjee. Turning off, uh, turning it over to Professor Chen. Hi, uh, it's my great pleasure uh, to talk with many of you, and good morning and good evening, depending on your time zone. So I was an Abe Fellow uh, in 2019. I was so lucky uh, to spend time in Tokyo, the University of Tokyo, at Center for Spatial Information and Science. So I'm going to talk about the flood risk management and how uh, Japan, in particular, the Tokyo, they have been dealt with uh, flood risk management and how we can learn lessons uh, from their experience. So uh, in October 2019, there was a typhoon called the Hagibis. Some of you may remember it was a category five uh, typhoon. The higher the number, the category five is the most uh, devastating uh, typhoon. And in a warming world, when you have higher ocean temperature, more water evaporates to the atmosphere, and those uh, extra energy from the tropics is transferred to the mid-latitude. That's what happened uh, in, September, uh, in October 2019. 
and it uh, has tremendous damage and disrupting uh, a lot of city infrastructure. So as you can see uh, from this figure, so the amount of precipitation in a very short period of time is over like uh, five uh, millimeters, so which is more than a third of annual precipitation. So in the last decade, uh, from two, 2010 to 2019, there are four major uh, disruptive uh, weather-related disasters, uh, including Hurricane Hagibis. So you can see uh, those extreme events are becoming more common with uh, climate change. So how do we deal with those uh, climate-related hazards uh, in an urban environment? So we have to look at like, a three dimension the social, ecological, and technological dimensions, because city include like, people and its environment and a lot of infrastructure, and they are tightly interconnected with each other. So once you make any change in one component of the system, it's gonna have a cascading impact. And a lot of those uh, social, ecological, technological elements are also common and public goods. So there is a way we can uh, intervene some new uh, changes to make uh, good for the entire public. And so urban uh, flood management uh, rely on those uh, interactions. So how we can actually uh, change the system uh, to create more resilient future. So in the literature, uh, there are uh, learning loops has been suggested. There are three uh, different types of learning. One is single loop learning. This is more like a reactive learning, for example. Let's say there was a big flood and people tried to increase the height of dike by uh, 20 centimeters. That's more like a reactive, just short-term fix. Versus the double loop learning is uh, you have more uh, reframing, changing like, assumptions and framework. And then, for example, if you change uh, flood risk management, maybe we need to look at both surface and groundwater management together. And now we want to consider the future climate change but still doesn't uh, fundamentally change the context. So the triple learning is the most advanced. And as the previous uh, speaker mentioned, let's say instead of uh, building dikes or uh, creating new infrastructure, maybe we need move people out from vulnerable zones. So completely relocating people. So that may be considered as a triple learning. So I uh, combine those uh, sets of social, ecological, technological systems uh, with a social learning framework to understand urban flood resilience. So in the first uh, single loop uh, tech, uh, sets framing, you can see the te technological uh, systems uh, still dominate the system, and then you're more reactive. But uh, once you have double loop learning, you can change the assumptions and goals. Now you have more social elements included within the set system, but still uh, the ecological components are lacking. And then uh, with a triple learning system, you have more uh, direct interactions among different components of the set system. You can see the social, ecological, and technological system within the triangle uh, interact more closely. And then it uh, has a much uh, deep uh, changes in the context. And you consider both uh, past and future uh, climate events. And then you can uh, uh, map those uh, social elements and ecological and technological elements. So I use a uh, government uh, document to conduct a content analysis. So we look at two different years, whether there is a social learning. So documents I used was the city comprehensive plans and the hazard mitigation plan. And so we look at uh, the relevant uh, text and then uh, quote uh, and call those. For example, let's say we talk about uh, safe, uh, changing uh, life safety and preventing a uh, life threatening situation that belong to emergency management. It, it falls under social uh, domain. So based on this, so I created a, a spider diagram. So you can look at the, how the comprehensive uh, plan, uh, the change happened. So you need to look at two things. One is the shape of the diagram and the other is the size of the diagram. The larger the size of the diagram, that means you have more frequent uh, 
mention those strategies. So the over time compared to 2019, uh, 2009, the 2017 have a larger a polygon size and more uh, technological uh, solutions mentioned in uh, city comprehensive plan. But also the social uh, strategies have expanded over time. But in contrast, the lack of mentioning in the ecological uh, strategies. In the city of hazard mitigation plan, you can also see similar uh, changes over time. Now uh, you can see the more social strategies such as the knowledge transfer and collaboration and emergency management are more frequently mentioned in the later years. So one example is a social technical solution. It's uh, called Super Levy. It's very unique in uh, Tokyo. So you compare the traditional levy versus the super levy. So the traditional levy, you have very narrow band, and all those houses uh, got uh, the views are blocked by the levy. And also those houses are located on somewhat unstable uh, soil conditions. Versus in super levy, you have very gentle slope, and you embank the soils on the super levy, and you construct those apartment buildings, and they're relatively upscale neighborhood. So this can be considered as a new a development, a new housing a development. But at the same time, the city has realized the one water concept. You have to deal with both a fluvial, the overflow of water, and the urban and fluvial flood, like a street flooding that can happen as a result of intense precipitation. So you have to integrate those uh, two different laws into one. So the city attempts to uh, change uh, their regulations. And also, uh, we need to rethink about the new development uh, in those uh, flood-prone areas. So after the hurricane, uh, the typhoon Hagibis, the Ministry of Finance stressed maybe we don't need to develop all the areas if those uh, locations are very vulnerable to floods. With that, I appreciate the Abe uh, Foundation and the Professor Takashi Oguchi for my host. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chang. Turning it over to Professor Aldrich. Thank you very much. Are my slides visible? I'm assuming they are. Okay, so good morning from Tokyo and good evening from America. Uh, thank you to our hosts, of course, the Abe Foundation, the SSRC, and thank you, Mary Alice, for hosting us as our moderator. I want to talk really quickly just about an interesting aspect of research that's been on my mind now for a little bit of time which is, I think, been touched upon by previous speakers for what I'm calling social infrastructure. And I'm going to begin with a story, actually, of two communities in Japan, uh, Taro and Sumohama, which are pretty close neighbors, actually, up in the Tohoku region of Japan, which, as we all know, was hit back in 2011 by a major earthquake tsunami and then nearby the nuclear meltdowns at Fukushima. These two communities, Taro and Sumohama, had literally centuries of human existence with tsunami. Both of them faced the same shocks over time. Both of them had devastation and regular loss of life roughly every 50 to 100 years as another tsunami came in. But Taro and Sumohama chose two very different ways to confront those regular natural hazards. In Taro, this is the image on the left of the screen, they built what became known as the Great Wall of Japan, a 15 meter tall seawall made of concrete that actually bankrupted the community twice in the 1960s and 70s. Now, in contrast, in Sumohama on the right, rather than building this massive set of seawalls, which would encompass the entire community, they instead decided to build a set of natural, natural drills, uh, ways of getting people out of the community quickly, organizing, providing information, uh, a, a form of social infrastructure centered around the city hall and libraries. And I'll just ask you the question maybe to answer later, where would you rather live if you had to choose one of these two and which of these two communities do you imagine had this lower levels of mortality on 311? But our research in our lab is focused on the fact that these kind of spaces and places like we saw in Sumohama where people get together and carry out activities are a critical element of life, not just for daily activities, for improving quality of life, but also for building the ties that also build resilience. So we've categorized these kind of facilities into four different areas. Uh, we're calling one parks, community gardens, open spaces, lagoons, like we see in the left hand, community centers, like uh, Jidokan or community taikan, for example, in Japan, places of worship, like we see on the left, 
and also social businesses, uh, pubs, restaurants, karaoke bars, video game parlors. And these four types of spaces aren't normally thought of as part of a disaster risk reduction scheme. In fact, if we're lucky, if we have time in our lives to get outside and spend them in these kind of spots, given our time on screens. But we found is these are really critical spaces in society, whether in Japan, in North America, we have research right now in Pakistan and in India and in Israel as well, showing that these kind of facilities, community spaces, places of worship, social businesses and parks, they are spaces which create a very specific type of social bond or reinforce a special type of social bond that we call bridging social capital. Bridging social capital is the kind of connection that bridges people who are different. That sounds pretty mediocre and who cares, but the reality is that the vast majority of us, if we categorize our connections, have a lot of bonding ties, people who look and sound like us, same background, same ethnicity and so forth, and relatively few linking ties, ties to people in authority. But these bridging ties, ties to people who are different, these are really special, really important. Uh, they're able to create ties and give us information, as we'll see in a second, that are hard to get with our typical networks. I had the pleasure of working with a program called Ibasho in Masakicho under the direction of Kyoto Emi, which has sought to deliberately create these kind of connections, uh, that is to say spaces and places uh, in society. And Ibasho was built for crowds over 65. Everyone in this image you see wearing a yellow vest, they're the board of directors of Ibasho, they're in Masakicho, they make the decisions. And this community center was built literally in a community that had no such social infrastructure. It was built in a community that had been created after the 311 disasters, people did not know each other. And what we found was by tracking how this community is impacted by the creation of this Ibasho project, the number of friends people had went up, their sense of belonging increased, and the sense of efficacy also increased. So these projects, these facilities, really can change the way we interact. We've also studied how the presence or absence of these kinds of facilities in a community during a shock changes the outcome of that event. And in fact, we traced over 700 neighborhoods throughout Japan and discovered communities with more parks, more social infrastructure, more uh, karaoke bars, more cafes. Those communities did better than similar communities that didn't have that level of social network density. So, by the way, just as a side note, if you believe this is only in Japan, in fact, we found the same results in North America as well. Communities with bottom-up social infrastructure investments aftershocks had better economic and better migration recovery. So those are pretty good, consistent results we found across North America and Japan. Um, why should we care? Well, just to wrap up, several ideas. One is that we don't have a lot of information on the distribution of these kind of social infrastructure, these facilities where people build connections. We've got very good maps of social capital, ironically, easier to capture an intangible item, but libraries, parks, uh, those there's no one database that we have. So the first thing is we lack information uh, on where we can find these kind of projects. Next, we also know that in the few communities that we've located, when we've been able to in fact map a community, uh, this one is from Boston, for example, there's tremendous inequity at distribution levels of these kind of processes. The wealthiest communities seem to have the most, those are the top there, and the communities at the bottom, uh, which have less money, uh, seem to have a far fewer of them. So just like schools and health infrastructure is not distributed equally, unfortunately, these really important projects, which can build disaster risk reduction, are not distributed e equally. And final point that you can probably recognize is that certainly both in North America and Japan, the spending on what we call gray infrastructure, levies, berms, dams, walls, those kind of things, is about 96% of the money being spent uh, in investments, and only around 45% is actually spent on these kind of local community uh, building processes. So just to wrap up then, oftentimes thinking about disasters, we think about berms and, and di dikes and dams, and those are certainly important aspects, as we've heard from my colleagues. But at the same time, there is a whole category of facilities that we don't think about as disaster risk reduction facilities, libraries, community spaces, parks, uh, bars, uh, pubs, and so forth. And those are really underappreciated and underinvested. Uh, the more that we can do in our societies to think about these as a next level of investment to build societies that are more equitable and more resilient, I think the better. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Professor Aldrich. Um, we'll now have some uh, time for a uh, panel discussion among the panelists. And for those who are listening in the audience, if you want to put any questions that you have uh, using the Q&A function, we'll get them after we're done with the panel discussion. Um, sort of pulling off of the 
the points that just came out of the last uh, presentation about um, social infrastructure, all of the presentations talked about the interconnected nature between social and physical infrastructure. And in many ways, this is sort of a chicken and egg setup where if you have certain kinds of physical infrastructure, people adjust their social behaviors to interact with the physical infrastructure that they have. And then also they build physical infrastructure to accommodate the social infrastructure that they have. And so it's a, it's a cycle that goes around. Um, and I wanted to ask sort of the whole panel uh, to reflect on, since you come from very different um, research backgrounds and uh, perspectives from your disciplinary uh, avenues, what you think about the sequencing of building physical infrastructure leading to social environments uh, changes and or the reverse of that. So how changes in social behavior or social infrastructure might then influence the way that um, that physical infrastructure is built, particularly with respect to disasters and resilience, uh, thinking especially towards climate change, where uh, some of these things are on the on the horizon and it might be a one a one off thing now, but it's likely to happen in the future. Uh, I don't know how to uh, choose who goes first. If someone wants to just raise their physical hand or their little orange Zoom hand, uh, I'll I'll take uh, take comments whenever you feel like. Yeah, go ahead, Professor Aldrich. Yeah, first of all, I think this is a great question, and certainly it's never black and white. Wait, right? When we only need one or the other, and I think there is an interaction over time. I think there is an important element, though, that we've seen in past shocks and disasters when there's almost an over reliance. I would argue on the presence of seawalls, berms, and dikes. Uh, that is to say, certainly in communities where they have had these for years and gone bankrupt, many residents that we interviewed uh, who had family members who didn't survive said one of the reasons they didn't leave early was because the presence of these walls told them they didn't need to. Uh, the very presence of large-scale 14-meter walls, which had bankrupted Taro, for example, um, ended in many cases with people going on top of the walls or not being able to see the hazard it was coming or feeling comfortable without the need to evacuate. So it is absolutely true, right? The presence of these walls uh, gives a sense of security and then people do build behind them. And we see this pretty regularly. Uh, I think we need to have a broader question then for society, which is you know, when we know that these areas are vulnerable, they've been hit by tsunami, not just once, not just twice, but literally dozens of times over the past hundreds of years, you know, how do we balance the need for society to have a convenient close to the ocean kind of location uh, with the real dangers that come with having this? And some societies like India, for example, have tried to ban uh, the presence, for example, of uh, coast, coastal communities. Uh, and also, of course, in Japan, after 311, many communities were asked to move back right, several kilometers from the coast to make it less likely to need these kind of large scale berms and dams. Anyone else? I can I can maybe, um, unless there is somebody else. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Um, I think this is such an important question that um, we need to consider all the time and not just during or after a disaster. Uh, because what I observed in uh, my work in Japan was that communities who had really good social, strong network bonds were the ones who were able to advocate well for themselves um, as to what types of infrastructure they want to be built in their communities. They were much more well organized. They knew how to ask for what they wanted. I mean, they were able to organize well in order to ask what they wanted um, or how they wanted the communities to look like. They, they were able to put their vision forward um, in terms of what kind of hard infrastructure or maybe not hard infrastructure that they want or maybe not the type of infrastructure that the government was envisioning for the communities. So that social um, strong network organization within communities, I think, is important regardless of whether we are looking at a disaster, a post-disaster event. Um, and I think a lot of that, the reason um, some of the, the, the way elderly populations were isolated in these apartment blocks was because they lost that social, their strong social network, because when they were taken from the coastal communities that were flooded into first 
first phase was the temporary shelters, they they were fragmented all over the place. There were so many temporary shelters. And then from there, when they were moved into apartment buildings, public housing apartment buildings, they were again, they went through another uh, level of fragmentation. The bonds that they had built in their temporary housing, temporary shelters were again fragmented as they were moved into um, apartment buildings. The government did have, um, uh, you know, there was a policy that if there were five or more households coming together, they could move collectively into public housing units, but not everybody could do that. And so, yeah, so this so this is something that we need to think about all the time. Thank you. Professor Chang, Professor Sand, either of you. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, like previous speakers, I think infrastructure is a really long life lifespan. So once the infrastructure is constructed, it's going to have a huge impact for decades, right? So, and, and let's say we built a dike and all the dams, and then people have a kind of false security. So, okay, because of those dikes and uh, dams can prevent uh, flooding, and then they uh, leave and then do something behind the dike. And then when there is a big a catastrophe disaster happen, it's going to have much uh, bigger consequences. So there's a new concept of uh, living with water and living with flood. So when you redesign our uh, urban areas, maybe we need to uh, inundate the city park. The city park can be a space for recreation during normal uh, time of the year, but when it has heavy rainfall, it can flood and then uh, find some space for water. Otherwise, in a heavy uh, developed areas, we need to still find a space for water. So one way was, uh, as Professor uh, Sand mentioned, those big underground uh, drainage channel, but it comes with huge cost. So I think when we redesign the city, so this is actually a prime moment because a lot of cities have, particularly in developed countries, have aging infrastructure. And with climate change, with uh, declining populations, I think this is a golden opportunity for us to rethink and redesign our infrastructure, which is gonna have a huge uh, impact for their case coming now. So I think, I think we can probably use this moment as an opportunity to redesign our infrastructure. So how does the social infrastructure can actually inform us as a uh, professor, who can you mention about engaging those community partners and what the community want and how we can co-create and co-produce those uh, things together. Thank you. Professor Seth, yeah. Yeah, just to round out this conversation on the question of uh, social versus physical infrastructure is a kind of a chicken and egg problem. I think one of the things that bringing the history of a place like Edo, which up on such a different logic uh, into play here does uh, is it uh, uh, makes more visible the priorities of government. And this ties to, to Daniel's point about um, the amount of spending that goes to gray or hard infrastructure versus social infrastructure. Uh, I, I don't want to uh, portray Edo as, you know, this um, ecological utopia, which some people like to do, uh, um, but rather to note that um, the priorities of government were very, very different. And this was a government that, in a certain sense, enforced a social infrastructure. It's not something we would wish for today because the priority was on maintaining status within a hierarchical society, obviously not a desirable uh, uh, model. Uh, um, but what it meant was instead of investing in the gray infrastructure part. They uh, ensured that social infrastructure uh, uh, was maintained, sometimes through draconian policies, but I think it also uh, um, reinforced local level, a healthy forms of, of social infrastructure. So it seems to me we can see there where a government has placed its priorities. We might imagine a better balance in which uh, investment in social infrastructure was recognized as disaster prevention to an equal degree, much as Daniel uh, is suggesting. Thanks, that's uh, great insights. Uh, so another question that I had uh, that I'd like all of you to respond to 
is an undercurrent that sort of went in everyone's uh, presentations around a tension that happens after uh, devastating disasters in which one of the most horrible parts of them is that the physical infrastructure is flattened and it's gone often. And that also offers an opportunity uh, to build something different there if you want to. And so I'd like you to speak to this tension in the rebuilding process between restoring what was there before and building something for new for the future. And that is a, that's a tension that faces all communities um, all the time, but it's particularly acute when communities are making decisions about what to do rebuilding after disaster. And uh, I ask you to reflect on that and see if you hear what your thoughts are on how uh, both the best way to do that and whether there are insights from the Japanese experience on how to navigate that, that tension between restoring some kind of historical uh, configuration and building for a future that doesn't exist yet. Anyone could go first. <laughs> I'll just jump in and I say one of my colleagues, Peter Montanley, has been studying the seawalls in Japan. And I said, none of them actually have built in anything at all for climate change. So if you look at the reports that are written, if you interview the engineers that are there, speak to local government officials about these seawalls, many of which were destroyed by 311, by the uh, March 11th to triple disasters, many of them were built exactly as were or a little higher, but no discussion there. Well, how will this be changed in the future by the presence of higher seas? So I think there is a bit of a lacuna in the broader Japanese policy sphere. But to which degree are we taking seriously this idea, especially with so many vulnerable coastal communities, uh, the spending that we're doing on these projects? I think we have to keep going back to this idea that spending really does indicate our priorities. Uh, and for so many Japanese uh, ministries, for example, uh, much of their enforcement has been on the idea that, you know, the spending priorities of gray infrastructure, of roads, of bridges, even for declining rural areas, has been a long-term policy idea of sort of moving development away from the center, from Tokyo and out to the periphery. And I, I always wonder when I see that being done to degree which is forward thinking and also uh, flexible. Do, do we really need to spend, as we have in, in some cases in Fukushima and Futaba, almost a million dollars per person on some of these processes, right, for very, very small returns? So I do think that this is a broader area that we need to push government officials and local governments to think about uh, to what degree is the future really in mind as communities try to plan for what to do after a disaster. I'd like to hear Anurata's impressions on Sendai in this respect too. I mean, certainly there were uh, negative lessons as well as positive, but I wonder whether Anurata wants to talk about Sendai reinventing itself a little bit. Yeah, I was I was thinking how to respond to this. Um, so I will go back to what I said about placing communities at the center. And when I say communities, I, you know, communities we can look at community at different levels. It's the local government, it's neighborhood. Um, I'm talking about really grassroots at you know the neighborhoods who've been impacted and um, discuss with them the vision that they want for any future recovery or reconstruction, because um, if you want buy-in from communities, then that would be the way to go. Sendai had a mixed, I would say mixed success in that. Uh, the communities that I showed you along the coastlines where the government had already decided, the local government, that they are going to make that into an evacuation. I mean, and, and you know, they had, a, a, uh, put uh, through an ordinance to um, create that as a no-build zone. So they had already decided that, and everything that moved after that was to put that ordinance in place and move people out of there. However, just behind that no-build zone were also other communities who had been flooded, but they were not um, at that front line. They were not right at the coast. And so some of them... Um, actually worked with the city of Sendai, and the city of Sendai hired uh, non-profit uh, entities who would do uh, like a public machizukuri, local public participatory process, a real participant, not, not just information meetings where the, the city government is coming and telling them, this is what we are planning to do. No, they had a real participatory process where the, the local community, including youth and women, uh, so different demographics, because often these local 
uh, neighborhood councils are dominated by men, elderly men um in japan and so there was like this host of different demographics who came together and put together a vision for their community how they wanted to build which parts of the neighborhood they wanted to relocate and which parts they wanted to keep how they wanted to keep it and and so on so there is a pathway there are examples that we can uh think of uh but the community has to be placed a uh, center to that um and and so that's um, that's I think that is really worth learning from Japan that aspect that how they did um, some of the communities were able to do some real uh, participatory work that actually led to greater resilience at the local level for those communities and and greater satisfaction and buy in into what what came later on. Well, in terms of like uh, <laughs> resolving the potential tension between what uh, we are going to go back to the previous state versus what we're going to envision for the future. I think the education is the key here because things will not be the same what it used to be. So in the water resource management, for example, the stationarity is that we cannot simply rely on past data to project what's going to happen in the future. The system may be changing in a completely different state. So we need to uh, demonstrate and then educate the general public and other uh, stakeholders. So we got to prepare for the different future. We cannot simply go back to the original state, which may not be uh, resilient. So, but with constant engagement of those communities in various ways, so we could uh, teach them, but also the scientists and the community stakeholders, they really need to bring some things together uh, why uh, it's important to re envision the future in a very different way, the fundamentally shifting the all the concepts and the assumptions and the ideas. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Sand, would you like to add anything? Not really. <laughs> okay, let's move to let's move to uh, uh, Q and A from the audience. Uh, if anybody out in the audience would like to add questions, uh, please feel free to add it through the Q and A function. Uh, the first question that I'll um, share with the panel is from Elang, um, who thanks everyone for the insightful stories. And the question is, what can we learn from Japan's post-disaster policy when we think about reconstructing from the wildfires in Maui? So most of the stories here have been um, about flooding and earthquakes, although Professor Sand also shared about fires, uh, but wildfires are also a little bit different. And so I, uh, this question is asking about how can we take the lessons from Japan and apply them to reconstruction after the wildfires in Maui? Anyone wanna take the first step? Um maybe I can go because I'm going to be really brief on this one. The, the res My response to the previous question um, is what I would say to this question, placing communities uh, at the center of this and, and meaningfully, um, not just, you know, kind of not lip service to community engagement. Um, and, and also a couple of things I wanted to note that in Japan, very interestingly, since we're talking about infrastructure at the coastline, uh, the, the national government of Japan actually removed uh, environmental impact assessment, doing environmental impact assessment for these large infrastructure projects at the coastline in order to expedite them. So what we are doing is we are we're building all these dikes and everything, but there has been no environmental impact assessment because they wanted to expedite the process. Um, and also the construction industry in Japan is extremely strong. Um, Japanese up, um, Disaster recovery is very much engineered driven. And so, you know, speaking to what Daniel Eldridge was saying earlier that, you know, we kind of need to focus on the social aspect. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time in Japan, uh, th there are these certain lobbies which are very, very strong. And so to kind of break that, um, I agree with what Hee Chang said, there needs to be more public education, perhaps. Thank you. Others? I just jump in and add to what Professor Mukherjee said. I, I completely agree. And I think also 
thinking about the role, especially of indigenous communities in Hawaii is so important and listening to those voices. I think we've heard this from several colleagues, which is in the reconstruction process, it's very easy to have an outside expert, a top down national or regional government person come in as has happened in Japan's case and also happened in Hawaii's case and sort of tell the locals, well, here's what you should do rather than taking what is often the messy and slow process of listening to the local community. And I think some of the most interesting work that's going on now is trying to figure out how do we build taking seriously the needs of local communities, uh, given these strange processes of government intervention or construction lobbying, um, how do we make sure the community that's being built is actually resilient to future shocks? Uh, and in the Hennes case, I think it's important to point out as well um, that the early warning systems there didn't work. There's a debate about why that didn't happen. But oftentimes we think about technology as the first sign, as the first uh, wall of first defense that we have. And here again, we saw with pretty good regularity that it wasn't what would happen. That's not how people got saved. It was neighbors saving neighbors again. So again, here, both thinking about the systems that were in place beforehand and how they're going to rebuild. I think it's so important to sit down and have both outside developers and local community members have that conversation about what, what kind of community do they want to have for the future. Thank you. Any other thoughts on this question? I think addressing also the social infrastructure, but also looking at both uh, social and technological infrastructure together. So a lot of those uh, post the wildfire or post the floods and earthquake, sometimes the infrastructure is very vulnerable when there is a big shock. So in that regard, I think more distributed infrastructure. So maybe we have more uh, storage for energy and water or food at the community level and how they can at least uh, mitigate some uh, the uh, disruption that happened in a short period of time. But also uh, we need to have some more redundancies so in infrastructure management, like a redundancy may not be necessarily bad, but if you're trying to rely on one big infrastructure, what if that infrastructure fail? Everyone will get affected. So I think we need to rethink about the way how we manage the infrastructure and how that has implication for broad society. So I'll turn to a final question from Malin, which is how did or would have social infrastructure influenced places like Fukushima, which had a triple disaster? So it's reimagining uh, the past and think about how better social infrastructures might have changed um, outcomes or, or did lead to different outcomes in Fukushima. I'll just really quickly say we did a project interviewing about 800 people from Futaba who had to evacuate because of radioactive contamination. And the one consistent thing that we found was that a variety of typical things didn't really help. Things like being wealthier, for example, uh, things like being younger, things like uh, having better physical health. But over and over again in interviews with them and surveys, the one factor that was protective of mental health, which unfortunately for mental people from Futaba was quite poor, um, PTSD, anxiety, concerns about radiation and cancer, um, the one protective factor was social ties they got through interactions with neighbors at spaces uh, in their communities. So at least in the research that we had done a few years ago uh, on Fukushima, what we, we found was that these were spaces that were protective of their mental health uh, in a very severe crisis. Anyone else want to speak to this question? Maybe I'll uh, say something I, a little bit unformulated still, but it seems to me that the, the critical difference about a nuclear disaster like Fukushima is the element of uncertainty, uncertainty about an ongoing risk. Uh, and in the case of the Futaba and other Fukushima communities that were directly affected People were forced to leave homes that appeared perfectly intact and were placed in a very vulnerable, almost abject situation in uh, temporary housing, uh, where I suppose they were able to maintain their social ties. It must have helped a great deal. Uh, but the tremendous uncertainty about what was happening to you, what the long-term consequences might be, make it very, very different from other kinds of disasters. And that and the fact that people have been displaced for an indeterminate period of time. Uh, again, you know, the, the contrast, for example, with a fire in Edo, which actually is very much like a wildfire, um, uh, it is very stark because there the, the source of risk 
it is spectacularly evident in a massive fire sweeping in, in your direction. Uh, and, and yet it's also knowable in a certain way. It's, it, it's familiar. This happened repeatedly and people got good at escaping and they knew it was going to blow through. This is also the case with typhoons in many places. And I do not mean to underplay the real uh, dangers and of course, uh, loss of life as a consequence in many cases. And so we need to continue to think about, uh, you know, uh, preventive measures and, and effective response. But the fact is that at a psychological level, they're totally different kinds of disasters. We're, our time is drawing to a close, so I guess I would like each uh, panelist to respond to sort of one last question, which is thinking about your research on disaster and resilience in Japan and sort of what we can learn. A lot of people uh, probably on this call and elsewhere talk about Japan as a like a unique and special and different place, uh, which of course it is because every place is unique and special and different. Um, and thinking and listening to your stories, they may be thinking, oh, well, that's all great for those Japanese people, but like that wouldn't work in my in my community or where I live. And so thinking about what your research is, if you were to pull one, one thing and say, this is a lesson that everybody can learn from the experience of Japan, um, what would it be? I can go and I'll go in reverse uh, reverse speaking order. So Daniel Aldrich. Well, a great question. So I, I guess I would emphasize that we've tried actually following the Abe Foundation's approach, which is a comparative research model. So we're not just looking necessarily at a, at a single country case. We found pretty consistent evidence that both in Japan, North America, and elsewhere, these places of connection, social infrastructure are powerful. So Japan's, I think, like the Masaki Cho Ibasho project has done a good job of showing us these do work, even in communities that had no connections before, and even among the elderly, were supposedly the hardest to connect. So I would encourage listeners who are thinking about how to make the communities more resilient to take seriously the role of social infrastructure. Thank you. Professor Chen. Yeah, actually, I was quite pleased uh, in a different way when there was a big uh, typhoon. So I want to use a train and I was so uh, impressed that the Japanese people line up because of the, all the disruption, the line was almost like more than like 100 meters, but no one uh, interrupted. So the the way the Japanese people don't actually uh, run or don't uh, go away when there is a disaster. I think that maybe they have learned those over time. If you run, everyone will die. First, if you come, at least some people can stay and they live, they can uh, uh, continue the generation. So maybe we can learn those social uh, skills. That was one lesson that I learned. And also, one thing is also when you uh, have those disasters, the communication becomes so critical. So all the language are written in Japanese. So I, I didn't get a lot when there was a typhoon. I look at the news and then I knew that there was coming, but uh, a lot of Japanese, uh, they use uh, the smartphone and also uh, there's a community center that uh, lets you know that how high the water level might be, but it's all written in Japanese. So something that uh, particularly in the diverse society like the US, we have many different uh, population and the immigrants, they're communicating the disaster in the right way at the right time, at the right place, can certainly help uh, alleviate those uh, risks. So I think I do agree that Daniel, so a lot of, when I look at those government's documents, they did a uh, shift from purely technological to social, but whether uh, that is transferring the budget and then all the implementation, that's still questionable. So now there is a plan, so the government agency need to probably implement those more social and also ecological strategies. Because uh, when you look at uh, water management, it all has some um, environmental impacts. So we have to look at those, uh, all of those things together in the set framework. That's my yeah, two cents. Thank you. Professor Mukherjee. So um, I do a work in the U.S. in eastern North Carolina, which is a predominantly rural area. So there is a bit of a difference between the work that I've done in Japan, which has been mainly in an urban, large urban area like Sendai and Ishinomaki, whereas the work that I'm doing in U.S. is mainly in rural communities. Uh, but having said that, um, 
and trying to connect to our discussion, the rural communities that we've been working with in here in Eastern North Carolina, they are very close knit, tight communities. So they have that very strong social uh, network and, and the connection. Um, however, they have other issues um, which are similar to Japan, such as aging and shrinking populations, um, lack of certain, they are very resource poor and so on. One thing um, I do think they can learn from Japan is, um, which Japan did very well, um, at least in Sendai, was um, figure out how to work with private and other entities to create affordable housing. Um, this is we are. <laughs> this is a crisis in the U.S. right now, uh, especially in rural areas when there is flooding and people have to evacuate. There is no place for them to go. I mean, there is no affordable housing in the community that they can move into, even if they had the funding to do so. Like there, there is no physical infrastructure, and so this is some. This is a place where they can really learn from Japan how to kind of you know create affordable. Um, housing. And I know that the U.S. policies have been such that they have uh, withdrawn from directly uh, creating public housing. The government doesn't want to be in the business of building public housing, but they can work with private entities to do so the way that the Japan has done. Um, and the, uh, just I want to touch on a difference that I also see is that in, in Japan, in some ways, what happened at the coast was this massive coastal retreat after the tsunami. It was not for sea level rise, uh, but uh, it was a coastal massive coastal retreat. Whereas in the US, there is some retreat going on, which is more incremental because of the way our policies are um, through buyouts and other, other ways. Um, but at the same time, all of this means that we do need more affordable housing. And so that's something they can learn from, from the Japan cases. Thank you, Professor Sand. Thanks. Yeah, um, actually, I think I'll respond uh, less in relationship to um, disaster management than uh, city building uh, for community, since community has played such an important uh, role in our whole conversation here. Uh, and my project uh, when I was doing my Abe research was more about commonalities between uh, Edo Tokyo as a megacity and other megacities around Asia, and particularly uh, the nature of marginal communities in them than it was about uh, Japanese uniqueness. Uh, and there, I guess I'd say that uh, in general, it's a sort of a cautionary tale for planners because it seems to me that much of what has made for good community in urban neighborhoods here uh, is the result of planning failure as much as it is of successful planning. And I mean, particularly the failure uh, of uh, large scale zoning and urban redevelopment, which often turned out to be costly in the long run for American cities, uh, has resulted in human scale walkable neighborhoods here. Uh, and I dare say that as uh, the uh, communities on the margin that may have started out informal or unplanned in other megacities uh, managed to sort of incorporate themselves into the uh, uh, urban life and economy uh, that we'll see similar things if uh, wholesale urban redevelopment can be avoided. Thanks so much to all of our panelists. That's uh, lots of things to think about. And I'll turn it over to Nicole Levitt to close us out. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks for a great uh, presentation and great discussion. Um, I'd like to thank the East West Center and Zoe Weaver for helping us out here today and hosting us so generously. Uh, all of our panelists, um, Jordan San, Daniel Adrich, Heejung Chang, Anuradha Mukherjee, and Mary Alice Haddad for her excellent chairing of the um, panel. Um, and also the Japan Foundation New York office and their support for the Abe Fellows Network and this Abe Global event each year. So thank you everybody and thank you from the SSRC. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>